In recent times, many people are questioning the ethics of pet ownership, and this is especially true when it comes to exotic pet keeping. It's gotten to the point that some animal rights groups feel that pet ownership should be justified morally if it is to continue and that animals should be left in the wild. Flipping this narrative on its head, however, is respected paleontologist Mike Archer. Not only does he agree with keeping at least some exotic animals as pets, he believes that doing so can prevent extinctions and may have saved the thylacine, or Tasmanian tiger, that tragically went extinct in the 1930s. Archer works for the University of New South Wales in Australia, a country that is known for its very strict wildlife policies. He doesn't believe that allowing residents to own native Australian wildlife would harm them in the wild, and that it would, in fact, according to him, increase the love and fascination that the average Australian kid has for native animals. At the moment, the only thing they care about really are the animals they live with. That's what they're really going to look after. Unless we set up breeding colonies and enable people to have a pet quoll instead of just a cat, we're not going to get that bonding that we need in the next generation to care about the conservation of our Australian mammals. Archer proposed, he views pet ownership as another potential method to conserve a species. Opportunities to have them as pets is another conservation strategy that will add to the overall likelihood of success. Is this a radical concept? Archer is correct about one thing. Domesticated cats are a beloved species and one of the most popular pets in the world. While invasive populations of cats threaten wildlife, removing feral as well as pet populations from the environment is often met with significant resistance from cat lovers. There are even organizations, such as the America-based Alley Cat Allies, that advocate leaving cats in the environment, despite evidence that they still pose a threat to birds and other wildlife. Archer proposed that maybe we should also be keeping native animals like the quoll, a small marsupial, as pets, and this can have the benefit of increasing the public's awareness of their plight in the wild. Archer also speculates that this practice could have prevented the extinction of the thylacine based on the evidence that some locals actually kept the unusual mammals as pets. Sadly, between 1888 and 1909, the Tasmanian government put a bounty on a thylacine due to sheep farmers who blamed them for killing their animals. Archer stated that it was illegal to have anything to do with thylacines, which were regarded as vermin, yet some people enjoyed them as pets. Yet we've done a lot of research on this, and it turns out a lot of Tasmanians were quietly discovering they make wonderful pets, and they were keeping them but it was illegal, and they ultimately had to turn them in and have them killed. If that had not been illegal, do you think the thylacine would be extinct today? Of course the answer is no. He continued on, Any animal we put our arm around and look after is guaranteed a future. It's those ones we don't care about, and we try to have nothing to do with. They're the ones that are endangered. While it is undeniable that animals that are commonly kept as pets certainly have an advantage when it comes to not being threatened with extinction, it is also the case that animals like dogs and cats, having evolved around humans, are very easy to breed and maintain. It is unlikely that thylacines would be similarly easy to breed and care for. In fact, in some of the documented cases where thylacines, which were also referred to as the zebra wolf and native hyena, were kept in captivity, they were described as difficult to work with. Australian author and photographer Louisa Ann Meredith described them as having untamable ferocity and savageness and that it resisted all endeavors to civilize and tame it, although this was sadly based on her experience with an older juvenile that was wild caught and separated from its mother, which was killed, and the animal was roughly handled by its captor. There are several accounts of thylacines that were captured from the wild and kept chained up by private owners or sold to exhibitors and circuses where they were displayed as untrained non-performers. According to Meredith, they made poor pets, as she wrote, I believe the tigers are truly untamable, and in that respect, if no other, merit the name sometimes given of native hyena. At least I know several instances in which young ones have been kept and reared up kindly, chained of necessity, but they never could be approached with safety, even by those who daily fed them, and so, on the whole, are perhaps ill-adapted for pets. However, 
Ballroom dancer and businessman Arthur Murray captured a thylacine as a pet, eventually selling it to the Bomaris Zoo on the 21st of July 1925 for 25 pounds. Another thylacine, kept as a pet by a butcher in 1874, was described as comparatively tame. An Australian newspaper discussed in an 1884 article a thylacine caught in a trap by Mr. Percy Tucker, who had, quote, chained him up in a stable just as you would chain up a dog. Mr. Tucker had been contemplating breaking the thylacine in to work sheep, although he did express doubts at this proposition. The article stated that, quote, the animal seems to take his captivity kindly enough and to be in blooming condition. He is about the size of an ordinary collie but longer in the body and is beautifully marked. While some of these accounts might seem to contradict Archer, it should be noted that wild-caught, parent-raised animals are often substantially different from captive-born animals, or those raised from very young ages, when it comes to captivity tolerance. Furthermore, the treatment of the thylacines was very poor in these earlier times. An exceptional case was that of Reg Trigg, an Australian footballer who bonded with a thylacine he captured in a snare, eventually achieving hand feeding and petting the animal. After some time in captivity, he released the thylacine, which he called Lucy, back in the wild after he became concerned for her welfare, and she came to visit him with cubs some time later. This evidence does suggest, however, that thylacines were very different from dogs and cats in terms of human tolerance, so it is questionable if pet keeping would have saved the ill-fated creatures. However, perhaps it is feasible that if thylacines were allowed to be kept as pets, those animals could have been used in breeding efforts once the wild population became functionally extinct. In fact, this is exactly what took place with the American bison, a species that was once heavily persecuted to the point of near extinction, but their populations were restored with the aid of ranchers who bred and stocked the animals. There are other animals that have the potential to make more suitable pets. Archer went on to describe one of the best pets he ever owned, his pet Quoll. I fell in love with this animal and this animal fell in love with me, he said. It was an obsessive user of a kitty litter box. It was clean. It was like a puppy all its life. It stayed playful, wonderful, lovable. I just can't say enough nice things about it. He also had a swamp wallaby. I had a pet swamp wallaby in the house with me and it was like a dog. It was wonderful, Professor Archer said. In fact, in another study, swamp wallabies were among some of the few mammalian species described as being one of the best exotic pets to care for according to specific criteria, so his claims are not that far-fetched. Of course, while a quoll and a wallaby made unobjectionable pets for Archer, this might not have been the case with someone else. This is simply the case with all animals. There is no one species that is perfect for everyone. However, just because a pet is exotic or isn't a dog or a cat doesn't mean that it is a bad pet or that it should be owned by no one. Whether or not pet keeping is beneficial for conservation, pursuing our unique interest is a fundamental human trait. In the case of the thylacine, it's a shame that keeping native animals as pets wasn't embraced as it continues to not be today.